His wounds have paid my ransom. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, as we go into reading Psalm 12, I wonder if many of you have the same feeling that I do, that after the last several months here, regardless of where you stand in regard to all of the issues of the day, it just seems like we're being inundated with statistics and information all of the time, which conflict. We hear things in as alleged scientific studies and firm conclusions that tell us one thing only to discover in the next moment a new scientific inquiry has told us the opposite. We live in a world, it seems very often, as if finding true information is profoundly difficult to do because there's just so much information out there. I think this is an important reflection for us all so that we can begin to appreciate what we have in Christ and what we have in the scripture. See, David as well lived in a world where lies, flattery, even misinformation prevailed. He had even less access perhaps to online resources to do some study to determine what was true and what was false. And what David leans into is the word of God as this pure light that shines into the darkness that we have made for ourselves as God's enemies. We need this word in Psalm 12 as much as any generation of people ever did. Now, given given the fact that we actually have an appetite to hear truths, to hear claims that agree with what we already supposed was the case, given that we have an appetite for flattery, even hearing things about ourselves that are praiseworthy but not true, we have to realize that we have certain defenses that come up when we go to God's word and it tells us something challenging. So let's begin worship today by bowing our heads and asking God to open our hearts and illuminate our minds so that we can receive the deep teaching of his word, that we can be brought by it back to the cross. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, how desperately we need your light. We need words that are true, words that are sure. Words, Lord God, that are marked by your very attributes. Words with an inherent authority. Words that are clear and perspicuous. Words that are most necessary and without which we couldn't navigate this life together. We need your truth. Mighty God, open our ears to it. Give us each and all a sense that the words that we're about to read, they're the truest words that we will hear all week because they're words that you spoke. I pray, Lord God, that that alone would sustain our attention and interest. And God, that we would, through these words, come to love the gospel and to love our Savior all the more. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 12. We're going to read verses 1 to 8. And then when we're finished, we're going to sing a short verse together, the Gloria Patri, to give God thanks for this word that he has spoken to us. Psalm 12, verse 1. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be For the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. The tongue that speaks great things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever, the wicked Strut about on every side. 
when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. This is God's word. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Well, if you ever felt like you were in a culture of flattery and lying Know that David knew that culture very well, long before any of us did. The beginning of this psalm opens with a cry of distress, a cry for help, as David notices how rare it is to find a faithful brother, a man of truth and integrity. He describes the culture of his day, saying they speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak says, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things. He speaks of people who treat their ability to use their lips, to use their words to their advantage as believing that there is no God above them in their reasoning powers. David knew this culture really well. It's the culture of kings. David lived in the house of Saul where all of the princes and the young men who had ambitious plans for themselves no doubt would gather and speak all sorts of foolish words flattering one another for their own personal gain, only half-heartedly believing what they're saying or maybe not believing it at all. David also knew this culture of flattery himself. We read that on returning from battle after having military successes, he would be met by the praises of the young women singing about how he had slain his ten thousands. David knew how fleeting the devotion of men can be. He knew how wayward their tongues could be. David's son Solomon would speak proverbs like this when a man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend. Note it doesn't say that there are friends. It doesn't use the plural. It says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It speaks to the rarity of a person who is honest with themselves. We all ought to stop for a moment and ask ourselves how much we believe in our own words, how much we trust our own ability to persuade, for persuade even for the ends of things that are not true. I met one man in a coffee shop one time. Sometimes I'll share the gospel with people impromptu. He looked like he was relatively successful. And I asked him if he knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point blank, there really was no lead in. It was pretty classic. He just threw his hands up and kind of sighed that I was one of those guys. He told me he did know it. He'd heard it many times. He tried it and it didn't work for him. So I asked him if he were to stand before God in judgment, what he would do, what he would say. And believe it or not, I'm rarely taken aback by what people say. He said this, you know, I'm pretty good on my feet. I'm pretty sure I could think of something. (laughs) You're talking to the omniscient God here. And what what, what are you going to say? Like, I'll I'll wash dishes in the back or something? Like, what sort of proposition are you suggesting you would have made? These are people who believe that their tongues... Their tongues can do great things. And they even ask the question, who is Lord over us? Undoubtedly, in the culture in which we currently live, this is uh, is a feeling that we live in a culture of flattery that confronts us on all sides. When you think about that class of people that we call celebrities and stars, when you think about Hollywood, it's impossible to think of anything but a culture of pure flattery. I recently watched a collage on YouTube. This collage featured all of the biggest stars. All of the biggest stars praising a man by the name of Harvey Weinstein. 
Madonna, Nicole Kidman, Jennifer Lawrence, Gwyneth Paltrow, Ben Affleck, Robin Williams, Leonardo DiCaprio, and I would just be getting started. In fact, Meryl Streep, generally regarded as one of the greatest female actresses of our time. She actually has a rather clever turn on a common thing that people do when they're receiving a reward. They thank God. But she follows it by saying, I'd like to thank God, comma, Harvey Weinstein. You think about a culture of pure flattery, a culture that just focuses on words that are going to get you somewhere, and you watch all of the biggest stars speak words that we know to be the very opposite of the truth about this man's character, and that in retrospect, they're all willing to say, I knew he was a little creepy from the beginning. And yet in the course of their careers, it didn't stop them from praising this man to high heaven. It's just a culture of lies full of gross exploitation. Notice in this psalm, in the same context as speaking those who speak of flattery to one another, it says, it says just as well that they take advantage of the weak and the lowly. Isn't that exactly what we have seen happening in Hollywood? I want to be very clear. I'm not against award shows. There's nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with giving recognition to someone who has a great talent in acting. Nothing wrong at all. But see, one aspect of flattery is not just saying things to someone that are false in order to gain some rapport with them. Flattery can also involve magnifying people's talents as if they were virtues and outweighed their vices. It's flattery. I think this is why I'm not the only one, you you can let me know later, uh, for whom Ricky Gervais' roast at the 2020 Academy Awards really resonated. I didn't watch any other part of the show. I think I watched that two or three times. <laughs> this culture of flattery where people's talents are treated as virtues. Virtues that give them insight into the world and a right to speak about everything from politics to religion to every social issue. As we reflect on this sort of culture, knowing it's our culture in part, we, we are like Isaiah, a people of unclean lips belonging to a people of unclean lips. Let me ask you something. What are you pursuing? What are we pursuing? To get a real good insight on yourself, you can ask this question. If you were granted one wish for how to alter yourself and your abilities, would it resonate with you more to wish that you had perhaps a great athletic skill, maybe the skill of an NFL quarterback that could get you a lot of money, or would you wish with that one wish that God would render you exceptionally honest? I want you to really think about that. Would you ask the Lord for a virtue as opposed to a talent? I think if we're all honest, we know that a big part of us would rather have the talents and figure that the virtues, well, we could work on those and they would follow. Friends, the reason I ask this is because we are increasingly in a world that is so prone to flattery that it becomes outright oppression if you don't play this game. In 2015, many of us know that there was a Supreme Court decision that redefined marriage. What it also effectively did is it redefined what it meant to be a husband, a wife, an aunt, and an uncle. All of those things got redefined by that one redefinition. And now today, we are redefining what it means to be male and female. And as I talk about this, I'm going to be clear. I know that we have surely many who are listening who are either uh, transgender themselves or who have transgender family members. I do. Many people in this church do. But we've got to talk about this, and we've got to talk about this clearly. In our culture today, it is being imposed upon all of us in our workplaces, increasingly and in public places, to use words to address other people that aren't true. Our culture does not think of it this way as a a matter of flattery, but when we have to tell people things about one another that are not true to protect one another's feelings as opposed to give credence to truth itself, there's something very oppressive about that. And I know for the family that I have and the friends who I care about, 
who are transgender, one of the things that often gets raised is this sense or this testimony to the effect that the way I feel in my heart doesn't correspond to what my biological gender is. And it feels unfair that I should have to use language that seems untrue to myself. I just challenge you, if you have thought in those terms or if that resonates with you, think about the evil involved, however, in making other people use words and language that especially according to their worldview in the biblical scriptures is not true. And ask yourself, if we're not in fact asking people to commit the very crime that one feels has been committed against himself. There's in fact vast double-mindedness in this culture that tries to advance a transgender sort of worldview. You know, I'll put it this way. Um, the culture that it once says we need to use other people's selected pronouns in spite of the biological reality, that culture is itself double-hearted, double-minded, as it says in Psalm 12. We know this because the vast majority of those who are in favor of redefining male and female or making it something that is up to people's subjective opinions would themselves not date someone who's transgender. This is a statistical fact. What this means is that they're willing to tell you something about yourself that they don't really believe about you. They're willing to call you male or female when you are the opposite, when they won't really interact with you as such. Ask yourself if that is not the depth of folly, not the depth of flattery, not the depth of dishonesty. I know it might sound crazy, but here at this church and believers in Jesus Christ, we love the truth. And we're not going to flatter one another. We're not going to flatter in place of speaking truth. I hope that's refreshing to you. Just recently, I was counseling one of our um, congregants who has um, a family member, a close family member who's transgender. And we were talking about the challenge of what it means for us to meet together. And one of the things is that we are especially committed in our family relationships to truth as opposed to flattery. And he was saying to me, Bram, how ought I to address this person that I care about? I don't just want to cut them off. And I suggested that what we've got to do, and I want you all to consider this yourself, because if you haven't thought about this, you're going to be faced with this. You're probably going to have to sit down with people who you love and say, let's figure out how we can navigate being together and talking together. See, I can't use language that is false. And I wouldn't expect you to do the same. So if you're near relation to me, it might be that when we're together, we have to use a more cumbersome code of speech. I'm going to call you cousin if I talk about you in the third person. I'm going to call you sibling if I speak about you in the third person. And I know that that's challenging, but here's the thing. Just as surely as you're not going to give up what you prefer to be called in the way of pronouns, nor can I. In honesty and without committing the crime and the sin of falsehood and flattery, do the same for you. So what can we work on? What can we speak together? These are conversations we're all going to have to have. But the answer is to not simply let go of the truth. Again, I hope that if you're hearing this for the first time, it's antithetical to the way you think. I hope at least you can hear good news that there's a community of people out there called Christians. For whom flattery is not something that we are going to give into. Not in the place of truth. I would actually ask everyone here, though, as we speak about these sorts of issues, do you rather love to hear compliments or the truth? What do you love? See, we're all in this together in different degrees and in different ways. What would you prefer? Compliments that don't correspond to the reality or the truth so that we might grow in Christ? Friends, you might know that these sorts of oppressive dynamics where flattery is required of you, they are not simply limited to a secular world. In the history of Christianity, we've had our own bouts with this sort of thing. 
as I'm preparing to do a, a class probably in the fall on you know, the history of Presbyterianism, one of the great uh, precursors to the Reformation were a people called the Waldensians. They actually began in about 1170 AD. It came about through the dramatic conversion of a man named Peter Waldo, a wealthy man who sold all that was his and lived a life of itinerant preaching. This man denied the reality of purgatory, which is nowhere to be found in the Bible, but was just coming to be a major doctrine in the 12th century. He denied that the Bible would ever commend to us praying to Mary. He denied that you could purchase indulgences to mitigate against the crimes you've committed in this life. Well, he and his people in the course of time came under an inquisition where it was required of them to speak things they didn't believe, to say Hail Marys, otherwise their life would be at stake. Many martyrs were made for centuries as a result of this. These people were as well maligned. They had the unfortunate name Waldensians after their founder, Peter Waldo. But that word in the Romance language that was used at the time was actually a Valdensians. And it sounds a lot like the word Valdez, which means sorcerer. These Bible-believing Christians who stood on the authority of Scripture alone were actually regularly convicted of being sorcerers, magicians, witches, and put to death. It's a dramatic history, friends. And we see how the evil of falsehood Flattery imposed on our neighbors can lead to the worst of consequences. As we've considered the problem, the very same problem that David suffered from, and we, in some degree, all of us, and in different ways, suffer from. Look at the awesome teaching of God's word with respect to God's word and his truth. In verse 5, it says, Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groanings of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace, on or down to the earth, refined seven times, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him, that is, the faithful man from this generation forever. I want to tell you about the word of God, friends. The Bible says it is like a precious metal refined. The refinement or smelting process in the ancient world was a means by which you would take a precious metal and separate it from any other sorts of less precious metals with which it might have been alloyed together. You'd put it in a, cr a clay crucible above the ground. It is a pot in the ancient world that would have been made of clay. And the precious metals that would weigh more when they're separated by the intense heat would go to the bottom. And the less precious metals would come to the top and you'd be able to separate the two. The Bible says that God's word is like that, like that glowing precious metal, which in the smelting process, when perfectly and completely separated from a foreign substance, would then be poured down to a lower level. And it's like a picture of God's glowing, pure, holy words in the heavens being poured down to the earth through the prophets and in God's scriptures. Silver, of course, was a currency like all precious metals. It was the most common currency. And this is to indicate that God's word is full of value. Full of value, unspeakable value. It's wonderful that it says the words of the Lord, the sayings of the Lord, the plurality of what he says, all of it down to the words are pure. Friends, the scriptures are not just true in their general message, in what they broadly speak. They're true down to every jot and tittle of every letter. They differ fundamentally what comes out of the mouths of men. And David, in this psalm, even speaks the word of God himself. He speaks for God in the first person in verse 5. 
giving articulation to God's perspective, I will set him free for the safety for which he longs, says the Lord. This is a truth for all of us to stand upon. In a world where lies and flattery abound, our God's truth, this perfectly refined, seven times utterly pure, utterly certain word of God comes to us as a word of protection. A word that he will keep his own. Friends, this flows from the fact that our God, you see, for him, truth and honesty, those aren't accidental qualities that sometimes attend who he is and what he says. They are his very attributes, incapable of being divorced from who he is in himself. It says in Titus 1, 2, God who cannot lie. It says in John 14, 6, or Jesus says rather, I am the way and the truth and the life. And in 1 John 5, 6, it says the spirit is the truth. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is so important that we understand. He is true in his essence because he is immutable and he cannot prevaricate. He cannot misrepresent himself. He cannot misrepresent the reality that he made and governs by the sovereign word of his power. See, God's knowledge of himself in his creation is absolutely exhaustive and immutable. He is the reference point of all truth. And not only that, but when God speaks, not only is every word on his lips true, but we know that our God, he alone knows and can speak the most relevant truths to the chaos in which we find ourselves. See, when we we understand who God is, we understand that God's word is self-authenticating. There's no higher authority that God can appeal to to validate his word. His word is the authority. It is the measure. It's the measure. Everything that is true, friends, owes its truth to the will and power and wisdom of God. See, is there a Puget Sound behind you? That isn't true just because indeed there is a Puget Sound behind you. It is true because the eternal, the eternal and omniscient and omnipotent God, he willed for such to be the case. That means every time we affirm something as true, it's not just because it corresponds to the fact, but because it corresponds to the immutable will and mind and thoughts and plans of God. When we understand this, I hope you have a newfound sense of the freshness and the life-giving wonder of what we do every Lord's Day. God's truth is prized in our worship. And we, so we put God's words on our lap mouths in responsive readings, in song, as we're going to sing Psalm 25 in just a little bit. In our confession of sin, in our assurance of pardon, in the word of God read and preached, in our confession of faith, in the very institution of the Lord's Supper and the blessing with which we conclude God's word. This pure and refined truth is what we get showered in. In our call to worship today, We spoke to one another, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. As we fellowship after this service, take up the mantle, take up the responsibility to speak words of truth and life and edification. This is part of our worship. And you take that mentality with you when you leave this place to be speakers of truth. One of the best ways to do this, if you've not yet discovered it, is to read the Bible in your home. Read it all. Read one chapter a day. Start in Genesis. Get to Revelation. And then start over again. Read it with your children. Read it with your roommates. We tell you something. Every time you read a commandment in the Bible, you're reading the only true definition of holiness and righteousness. Every time you read a story in the Bible, you are getting the truest insight into your own sinful tendencies and weaknesses and God's grace and saving power. 
when you read the songs of the Bible as we're doing right now, you will read the true longings and burdens and joys belonging to God's people. Do yours match up with theirs? When you read the genealogies of the Bible, you are reading the true account of this human organism of which you are a part and of its origins, its beginnings back at Noah and before him, Adam. When you read the Proverbs, you are getting the truest counsel for how to live in a peaceable, profitable, productive, God-glorifying manner when you read the gospel. The only true solution to the problem of sin is being set before you, which simultaneously preserves God's justice as true and his love as true at the same time as immutable aspects of his character. When we understand that, Trinitas Church, we realize that what makes us a church, that essential thing without which we would not be a true church, is the word of God faithfully preached and the sacraments faithfully administered and discipline according to the scriptures administered. See, friends, the Bible is not true because we, the church, say it's so. Rather, this word renders us a church, a bride, pure and undefiled, washed and cleansed in the word. With this wonderful sense in mind, what I'm going to set before you, somewhat rapid fire, are seven truths that you can just take to the bank, that you can celebrate for the rest of the day, that you can go forth in confidence with. The first is this one. I know that you've seen many church worship services either cease or go strictly online. We've had to do these things. And maybe it gives you a sense That this church of which you are a part, this broad body of Christ, is actually in jeopardy of ceasing to be. The first truth I would have you know is that Christ's church will never cease to be, nor will it cease to grow. David expresses the true feelings that maybe you've had, that the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from the sons of men. Church has disappeared. But David marries to these true heartfelt feelings, true expressions of the sadness in which we will find ourselves sometimes, true facts, saying that you alone, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him for this generation forever. I'll have you know this. I tell my kids this all the time. You better be ready for this. You will feel very alone sometimes, just like David did. But if you know the truths of God, this pure and refined silver, you know that you are never really alone. God always has people who love him. And it is your job, no matter where you find yourself in life, to go find them. Young men and women, if you go to college someday and you feel like you are the only Christian, that's not true. God has promised you otherwise, go find them. Don't stop till you do. We know that this church will never cease to be or cease to grow because guess what? This church is the body of Jesus Christ. And that body is like an organism with the head extending into heaven, the feet on this earth. Christ, our Lord, is in heaven. And he will tend to his body on earth says the gates of hell will never prevail against it. So the first truth you take with you is that Christ's church will never cease to be nor cease to grow. The second truth, get ready for this. No matter how popular the keto diet, the paleo diet, or the Atkins diet become, people will never stop baking bread. I know some of you are worried about this. I've dabbled with a few of these these diets before. But the good news, you take this to the bank. Baking will never cease to be. It might have some tough times, friend. And maybe in your neighborhood, they'll storm the Bastille and there'll be no bread for a while. But there will be bread. We know this. Because our Lord Jesus Christ commanded his church after breaking the bread to do this in remembrance of me. 
there will always be bread to break. Again, seasons of I hate us, maybe. But what a comfort to know. I know that when I'm on these different sorts of diets, it's actually my greatest comfort to know that despite my abstention, bread still exists. It's waiting for me. It's out there to be gotten. Take it to the bank. People will never stop baking bread. It's better news than you might have considered. Third, no matter how strong our economy becomes, the poor and the hungry and the desperate will never cease to be among us. Some of you are going, Brant, why are you hitting me with this truth that um, is a very unpleasant truth? I want to actually encourage you with this as Jesus intended us to be encouraged. This is a saying of Moses, a saying of Jesus. It's set forth in the example of David who during the speaking of this psalm was no doubt himself in a state of poverty, as he was often found begging for food when he was a fugitive. But this is not bad news. It's good news. When Jesus says this in the Gospels, he says it in a context so that we may be confronted with this fact. There will always be Christians who display in Deed and not just word that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There will always be Christians who have less material blessing and yet have more joy in the Lord. And this truth will challenge us till the end of time. People like Christ who had nowhere to lay his head and yet rather have as they know, a mansion with their father and whose faith is rich in the faith, face of weakness. This is good news for another reason, friends. It is good news because it means this for all of us who are relatively comfortable. There will always be opportunity for those of us who have resources to graciously give so that like it says in James 4.10, the rich man may glory in his humiliation. That is his self-humbling and giving from his wealth. This is the dynamic that will always characterize us, friends. Always characterize the world and the church. And you can look at it as bad news or you can look at it as good news. The fourth truth that I would have you take with you today is that every single lie that has ever been spoken will one day be exposed and the truth revealed. Do you find yourself distressed when you watch documentaries about powerful people who take advantage of others and yet they never get convicted? Do you get distressed when you see that the guilty are tried and declared innocent? or even when your own name gets dragged through the mud. You get distressed when there seem to be hidden evils at work in your very own government, and there seems to be no entity that can expose them. It can even be more mundane things. Are you just sure that the American moon landing of 1969 was faked in a Hollywood basement? Are you sure that Tupac is really alive? I've got good news for you. There will be a day when every falsehood is exposed for what it is. I can't say I'm with you on the moon landing, but I want you to know you're going to know for sure someday. And you'll know this in eternity, if not in time. You know, Many of us get distressed sometimes when there are prevailing scientific theories and we get worried that it's going to somehow snuff out the Christian belief system. Friends, there have been so many widely accepted scientific theories in the course of human history that no one takes seriously anymore that you needn't distress because truth is powerful. There used to be a science called phrenology where they believed that they could determine your character by touching bumps on your head. No one believes that anymore. The best science once told us that the universe was infinite in every direction and static in how it was. No one believes that anymore. 
There was a time when people believed in gradual evolutionary descent, that the way that animals evolved apparently took place in a steady process over a vast period of time. Neo-Darwinism doesn't believe that at all. You have to believe in rather radical leaps. Friends, you needn't fear. The truth is more powerful and there will be a day when every lie is exposed and that day often comes before eternity. Number five, there is gonna be a day, Christians, where every word that we all speak is going to be true. And even better, you're gonna like it. You're gonna like to speak nothing but the truth. Some of you had a, have a bad image of what this would be. You think there's gonna be a day where we, we become like computer fact speakers or something where all that we speak is true. It is overcast outside. Even when it's overcast outside, your words are gonna be more true than you could ever imagine. You're gonna be able to speak the depths and the beauties of every truth. You won't just say it's overcast outside. You will say, my goodness, this portion of earth is covered with a canopy of cloud that simultaneously distributes light all over the ground, but in a special way that keeps things sufficiently cool and moist and ever ready for rain to keep the Northwest beautiful and green with all its distinct flora, healthy, and all its diverse fauna, well-fed to the glory of God and truth will drip from your mouth because you will be made perfect and glorified by the work of Jesus Christ. Number six, there will be a day when everyone shows up to worship on time. <laughs> I'll tell you how I know this. See, it says in Ezekiel 44, 24, they shall also keep my laws and my statutes and all my appointed times. You just heard it. Everyone's going to keep the appointed time. Now, I'll grant a lot of people see this prophecy as referring to eternity. Strong arguments there. But I hold out the hope that maybe it might characterize the latter day glory of Christ's church on earth. It's not just that it's particularly distracting when sh someone shows up 20 minutes late to an outdoor service with a diesel truck. But it's the confidence that our society will increasingly grow as they are sanctified in Christ to value worship above all other activities. What good news. What a thought. It's a truth we can count on, especially in eternity. Friends, our seventh consideration, our final one, is that there will be a day when God's declaration that you are righteous will be true of your nature. Brothers and sisters, if you believed in Jesus Christ, understand that the righteousness of Christ has been credited to you. You are justified by Christ alone, through faith alone. This is how we have right standing with God on the last day. But here is the wonderful news. That declaration, true and certain in the present, it's married to a day when you will be resurrected in glory and you will really have no appetite for sin anymore. Your nature will be sanctified. This is truth. As we celebrate this good news that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone, let us have the flavor in our mouth. Let, our, let us have our appetites wet for the day when we will be conformed to the image of Christ in glory. These truths you can take to the bank, speak of them, celebrate them, and rest on the Lord's day. Bow your heads with me. Mighty God, we need your truth. We need your gospel. We need your loving kindness. Lord, there is a world that equates kindness with lies, kindness with flattery. Lord, we have an appetite for that sort of world and we pray that you would deliver us from it. 
You have justified us in Jesus Christ, making us your sons and daughters definitively and forevermore. And we pray that you would sanctify us. Give us an appetite for the truth. Give us an appetite above all other appetites for your word without which our souls cannot live. Lord Jesus, give us words of edification and life to speak to our friends, family, coworkers. And may a world trapped in darkness be set free by the gospel of your grace. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we're going to take an offering. Really is that a deacon just kind of has to go around with the offering bag. and uh, Or you can give online if you just go to uh, our website or you've got the church app. If you want the church app, well, ask Tim or Tony or one of us and we can get it to you. All right. Let's worship. Trinitas Church, we turn to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. This isn't a special opportunity for all of us to ask for the empowerment of Christ, to ask to be conformed to the image of Christ, that we might be the sorts of people, the faithful men that David laments there are so few of, that we might become that all the more to one another. We are also going to go ahead and lift up those who are in distress, not able to be with us because they are sick, and lift up our land for the same. So bow your heads with me. Almighty God, we come to you knowing that we need another type of food. We need a food that goes into us and, Lord, enables true words, true words to come out of our mouths. God, we ask for Christ to dwell more richly in us. You have called this sacrament, this meal, the body and blood of your Son. For just as truly as your Son reached out and touched and encouraged and empowered and healed people in his ministry on earth, so too are we. 
lifted up, encouraged, even having our worst faults revealed to us in your sanctifying spirit, dispensed to us in ever greater measure through these means of grace. Lord God, for those ends we pray. We lift up to you those who are not able to be with us, Lord, because they're sick or because they lack the means or they're simply downtrodden in spirit. We pray for our brothers and sisters that you would lift them up. We also pray for this land, Lord God, where there is so much fear, so much distress, so much concern. God, that people would be delivered from their fear of death, not because of what science can do, but because there is a gospel that takes away the sting of death. Lord God, we pray that our bold witness would be a part of leading people to this comfort and security in Christ. God, we also just lift up to you the many tensions in our land, socially and politically. Pray, Lord God, that justice would prevail in this land. Lord, King of Kings, we pray that there would cease to be looting and cease to be riotous mobs, destroying public property, even as we pray, Lord God, that a message of justice and equity would be heard by the powers that be so that we would bring glory to your name as a nation. Lord God, we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Trinitas Church, it is our great privilege to rise to our feet and confess with our lips truth about the nature of God's word itself, words of life that build up and edify. Grab your printed liturgies and let's confess our faith together, sharing what we believe about scripture. We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to in high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter and the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, we've got a sea breeze now, don't we? You may be seated. Same night on which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. And after having given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup. And after having given thanks, as we have done in his name, he gave it to the disciples and said, This cup is the new covenant which is in my blood just poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. If you've not been baptized, you just take the throat away. If you have not been baptized into Jesus Christ, you don't confess him as Lord, don't come to this meal. This is for those who believe in Christ as Lord and who are asking for his empowerment, asking for his grace in ever greater measure. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, come to the table. This declares to you a wonderful truth that you have a seat 
at Christ's table, a seat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Brothers and sisters, let's take the bread. This is Christ's body, which is given for you. Likewise, let's take the cup. This is Christ's blood shed for you. As we leave this place, let's go with a prayer <coughs> that we would be conduits of that great river, that great river of truth flowing from heaven to earth through the scriptures and through God's church. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, there is a world trapped in darkness who believes that the currency, the currency which is most powerful is the minted currency of the United States of America. But you have told us, Lord God, that the great and mighty world-changing life-giving currency is that which we find in your word. It is silver refined seven times. May we speak it. May we love it. May we read it. May we pray it back to you, Lord God, and share it with peoples, Lord God, who are perishing. We pray for the witness of Trinitas Church that many would come to saving faith through us and our witness. We pray, Lord God, for our brothers and sisters in every other church round about us where the gospel is faithfully preached, whether it be Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Charismatic or Episcopalian, we pray, Lord King, that you would advance your kingdom through our brothers and sisters. We lift up to you, John and Katie in Bangladesh, our missionaries. Lord, preserve them. God, they're speaking truth in a land where the religious powers that be are hostile. Lord, where they believe that they can close the mouths of your people and your witnesses. Lord God, preserve them so that the light may shine in the darkness. There and all over the earth, by the means that you have appointed, by the missionaries whose names we cannot name, protect them and give them fruit. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in